This Sunday is about moms. So this morning, our sermon will be on the mama of Moses. Their name, Jochebed. We have lots of moms in the Bible. Of course, we have Eve, the mother of all the living. Sarah, the laughing mother who didn't think she was going to have a child because of her age. Hagar, the crying mother, was sent away. Rebecca, the conniving mother. Isaac and Jacob. Leah, the unloved mother. Jochebed, who we'll be focusing on this morning, the trusting mother. Naomi, the restored mother. Hannah, the praying mother. Lots of moms in Scripture. But this morning, we'll be focusing on Jochebed. Her name means glory belongs to the Lord. Exodus chapter 1, a very startling and hideous uh, verse because of Pharaoh. Exodus 1, 22. Then Pharaoh, obviously the king of Egypt, gave this order to all his people. You'll recall the Israelites by this time had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. They're making bricks. They're, they're, in, a, they're in a bad way. And Pharaoh was worried about Hebrew men growing up and becoming strong and overthrowing the Egyptian government. So he gives this order. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River with the crocodile. But you may let the girls live. End of chapter 1 of Exodus, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. About this time, that is the time after Pharaoh gave this hideous ruling, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi, they got married. The woman gave, got pregnant, gave birth to a son. We know him as Moses. She saw that he was a special baby, kept him hidden for three months, defying the king. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds, waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket. In Hebrew, the actual word used, we just don't get it in English, but in Hebrew, the word used is A-R-K. Like a little baby ark. Her idea, of course, was that like Noah hundreds of years before her, that her baby would be saved. She put that baby in the ark, in the basket, laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And then, unexpectedly, the baby's sister stood at a distance watching to see what would happen, and Pharaoh's daughter, the princess of all of Egypt, comes to bathe the river. And her attendants walked along the riverbank, and when the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. And when the princess of all of Egypt opened it, she saw Moses. The little boy was crying. She felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. That would be her name? Yeah. Miriam. <clears throat> Miriam, yep. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women, i.e. my mom, the real mom of this baby? You know, very clever. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Princess Egypt. Yes, what a great idea. The princess replies, so the girl went and called the baby's mother, Jochebed. Take this baby, nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, I will pay you. Right, Jochebed gives away her baby, gets her baby back, and now gets paid to raise her own baby. I'll pay you for your help. So Jochebed took her baby home, and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother, again, Jochebed, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. So, we have this amazing story of Jochebed. She has a child. You can imagine during her pregnancy, she's probably hoping it's a girl. Obviously, doesn't want to throw her child into the Nile. Pretty obvious. But she is pregnant under the most extraordinary and desperate situations. So here she is, obviously artist rendition, putting her own three-month-old baby in the Nile River in the little ark and sending it away. 
Could you imagine giving up your three-month-old baby? This was Jochebed's situation. Now you can think about it for a moment. She's actually obeying the Pharaoh. She's putting her son in the Nile. But of course, in an ark, hoping for salvation for her child, entrusting her three-month-old to the Lord. So first she entrusts herself to God, then she courageously obeys and simultaneously disobeys the Pharaoh to protect her child. She entrusts her infant to God through this blazing act of faith by, well, it worked for Noah, maybe it'll work for my baby boy. And then of course she receives her child back from the Lord. What an amazing day that must have been. So at first she conceives him, she conceals him, she commits him to the Lord, and then she cultures him. Because what happens? The princess gives Moses back to his mom, Jochebed, and weans him until age three, four, or five, something like that, before she brings him to uh, the palace. And what is she teaching him for those years? All the great things about the Old Testament, how God created the world, about Abraham, about Noah, about Joseph, the patriarch. But we see that before Moses can save his people from Pharaoh, his own mom has to save him from Pharaoh. He never would become the leader of his people if not for his mom's courageous act of faith. In Deuteronomy, we read this in chapter 11. The Lord is speaking here. Fix these words of mine, that is scripture. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and your minds. Teach them to your children. For those few years, knowing she had to give her child to the princess after he was weaned, I bet you every day she was following this advice. Teach the scripture to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And parents, I know that you feel this burden as well to teach your children the scriptures from an early age. There's a song I love by uh, my favorite musical artist, Rich Mullins. Um, he says this in one of his songs in terms of teaching our kids about the faith. And did they tell you stories about the saints of old, stories about their faith? They say stories like that makes a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. And you was a boy like I was once, now speaking about Jesus. You was a boy like I was once. Was you a boy like me? I grew up around Indiana. You grew up around Galilee. And if I ever really do grow up, Lord, I want to grow up and be just like you. And moms, I know that's what you're doing. You're helping your children to grow up to be sons and daughters who love the Lord. There's another mother in the Old Testament, Hannah, who could not conceive, who was made fun of, in fact, at the temple, who wept often, and who went and prayed to the Lord and made a vow. O Lord of heaven of armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire life, and if you would call the story, the Lord gives her a son, Samuel, she does. She weans him first and then brings him to Eli. And he indeed grows up in the temple. She entrusts her son, just like Jochebed, to the Lord. I have a good friend of mine, Pastor Brian Morgan, and in terms of honoring our parents, our mother and our father, he says this. I think it's very salient. Giving honor to our parents. This is designed to be the primer school where every human being discovers what it means to love and revere God. We're not just supposed to learn about how to obey our parents when we're kids. It's the primer school for as you indeed are honoring your mother and father, as indeed you are listening to their instruction, as indeed you are humbling yourself and obeying them. 
This is preparation for when you become an adult, you become a child again. That is to say, you are always a child of God, and God is always your Heavenly Father. And the whole point of life is to love and revere God, and you are supposed to have learned that from your parents. And hopefully you got that lesson, because you don't really want to learn that when you're older. It's a much harder road. Moms, question for you. How did having children affect your faith and trust? in God. How did having kids affect your faith and trust in God? I asked this question to several of my friends on social media. I'm going to share two of their stories with you. But after I do that, I would like to do the same here this morning. I don't know which number this is going to be here. They're all on. They're all on, so then it, it'll work. Just have to turn it on. Good. So after I read these two stories, I'm going to come around, and if you could be thinking about the answer, how you would answer that question. How did having kids um, affect your faith and trust in God? So here, uh, my first friend, um, Diane, she said this. I'd really become an agnostic, but having this little being's life in my hands, she adopted her, I forget now, maybe it was her brother's daughter, um, amazing story. But here she is. Now she is entrusted with Safira, is the little girl's name. I had this little being's life in my hands. I felt there had to be something more. I felt no matter what I needed to do to raise her, I had to put her in the church. So she had that good foundation. Then when I decided to start taking her that first month, I just went by myself with her. I wasn't going to push my husband, since that, that wasn't our life. But then after a month of going to church, guess who showed up to? And this is not my last church. This is a couple. We are still learning and growing every day. And that's how having a child changed Diane's faith in Christ. Here's my other friend Denise. She says this, I didn't make a move to have children without God's direction. I studied scripture the entire time of my pregnancy. Created a three ring binder, she got pretty serious, <laughs> of his instructions about how to raise kids. Committed all three of my kids to God once here after the kids were raised, oh, excuse me, after they were born. I wore out the knees in countless jeans as I knelt at the foot of each of their beds as they slept in prayer for the entirety of their life at home. Whew. Those prayers now continue. They're all raised. They're all adults. The, those prayers now continue through each day from wherever I may, may be at the time. None of this can be done without faith in God and His abundant blessings. My faith has never been stronger. I honestly don't know how to do any of this, how to do any of life without faith in God. Amen. And so, moms, I'd like to ask you the same question. How has having kids affected your faith and trust in God. I think it would be a blessing if we could share with each other. Let, let our moms be the experts this morning. This was not something that I myself could control. There it is. Good. You're yes. just your child. Uh, you raise them, hopefully, to uh, have a strong faith. And you know that with your prayers that God will get them through whatever they go through. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. have a couple more moments? No. Oh, now. Now. Now they're coming. I uh, always knew I wanted to get married and have children. That was, that's just what you did. I had two daughters, and of course, now that they keep growing up and changing, 
I find that God has been in their lives and in my life all these years, and He continues to be. Because it just amazes me what my girls have become and what they do. And I know that besides me, my parents had a good hand in that too. And God. God was always there for them. And I, I thank God for that. Amen. Amen. One or two more moms would be willing to share how you had your kids affect your faith and trust in God. I didn't want children. There was, it just wasn't me. I told my husband that before we got married, and he agreed that that was going to be okay. And then, of course, my mind started changing, watching the kids around other people, and then my mom was close to, close to going to heaven, and she said to me, Stace, I don't want to rush you, but if you think you're going to have children, I wish you would try now. My son was three months old. We had our very first and only Mother's Day together before she went to heaven. I almost died giving birth to my son, but God pulled me through. So I knew that that faith, and there was only one person that could have gotten me through that, and that was him. Thank you for sharing that. Any other moms? One more or no? Okay, I'll yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I was thinking about this, and I thought back, because, of course, my kids are so much older, but when, uh, if anybody ever remembers Billy, Billy, my first child, I was on my knees all the time with that child. He, uh, well, praise God, you know, that he, um, turned out okay. <laughs> but then I was blessed with Alan, who was like 100% easier to raise. And uh, so, and Alan, I remember when he was in sixth grade, he read the whole Bible before I even did. So I was blessed with Alan, and he still is so faithful to God and is such a strong believer. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all. So, Jacob, Jacob, entrusts Moses to the Lord, receives him back, is paid to raise him for three or four years, gives him to the princess. The upshot of all this, of course, Moses saves his people eventually. And Jacob, as we look ahead to the New Testament, is remembered in what we call the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given, him, given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. They feared God more than they feared men. I close this morning with a story about my mama. My, my story is I'm the oldest of three boys. And my story is that from the age of eight on, my mom raised us as a single mom. My mom had two jobs, sometimes three, I think, to raise us up. So, money was tight. And I was in the backyard one day, I don't know, maybe I was 10, something like that, with my two younger brothers, and we had just gotten uh, carpet put in the living room, and so there was this big, long, um, this, this spool, tube, that's a great word, I'm going to go with the word tube, so the tube that was left over, kind of a cardboard tube, but it was pretty long, and being 10, and dumb. <laughs> I said to my two younger brothers in the backyard, I'll bet you I can take this tube and throw it on the roof. You're 10. Moms, <laughs> somehow you made it, you helped us get through all this dumb stuff we did. So, here was my dumb idea. I'm going to throw this tube on the roof. Of course, my brother's down, no, you can't do it, no way. Oh, yeah. So I picked it up, threw it, and where do you think it went? 
Right through my own bedroom window. About halfway up, right? Not even close. So, my first thought was, Mom's going to kill me. My second thought is, man, I know we don't have any money. Mom came home, poured out my guts, of course. <laughs> and mom said, it's okay. We'll get a new one. And that was it. No restriction. I thought I was going to mow lawns for a year. Pay it off. It's okay. Oh, moms. You represent to us God's love. Because <clears throat> God loves us too when we do stupid stuff. And we all do stupid stuff.